At that time the barn looked about twice that size. And uh, this end they kept the horseless, the horse carriages, you know. Yes, where that big door is. But it yeah. appeared to me to be twice that size. That's yeah, to me too. And have one, child. and they'd have machinery in those sheds at the back of it, and that would be probably filled with grain. Now that also was the shearing shed. I can remember having to take up uh, meals for the shearers. You know, you take up billies of um, tea and old sandwiches. Perhaps in those days you'd have a, you know, rather a thick hunk of bread and something on it, or hot scones, and that, they'd stop their work. Anybody coming to visit, you know, uncles or some, someone like that from the city, uh, they'd be intrigued with the shearing. I remember one of my uncles, Uncle Jack, uh, he was the youngest of the Hellias, my father's brothers. He went to the 1418 war and um, he came back and he settled on uh, resettlement land up near uh, Underbool. And I don't think he ever did very well. I remember going up there once to stay with him. And his wife was called Gertrude. Yes, she, she, actually she was Gertrude Murphy. And as far as I know, she was a school teacher and te taught over somewhere near Donald. I don't know if she was born there. Anyway, they married and she died when I was only quite a child. And I don't know what she died from, but I suspect she was tubercular. And she, I do remember as a, quite a young child, uh, seeing her at Auntie Laura and Uncle Austin Barnes. Uh, I can see them now sitting out in the front, and my auntie with them, and I thought, you know, at that time I didn't know really much about it, but they appeared to be taking special care of her. But I can remember her husband, Uncle Jack, here with the sheep one day, and I think he had the shears in his hand, and he made a frightful gash in the sheep. You know, you needed to be an expert. Uh, to do those things. Anyway, the, of course the sheep would have a lot of gashes too, as I remember, but they'd have a pot of tar or something like that, I suppose, some uh, chemicals in it, and the poor old sheep get dabbed over with the brush, you know, or whatever was in the pot, and then they'd take the fleeces and roll them out down the other end of the barn, and as I remember it, I think the barn seemed to be about twice as long as that, but I guess it never was. Well, there were a lot of us, and we'd quite often, always on school holidays, at Christmas anyway, we'd have cousins up from the city, there'd be the Perrys, uh, there were three of them, I think, Evelyn and Max and May, and then we'd ha always have the Harrys. Oh, that was where the Perkins came in, who died. There were, their mother died, and I, I believe she was tubercular. Now, probably people didn't get any care in those days, but Isabel and Ted, were left uh, as quite young children, uh, motherless. And uh, the father, Uncle Will, I think they called him, he was a teacher of Sloyd at the Melbourne High School. And he will always come up sometime in the holidays, but we're all the two kids. And I remember being very jealous of Isabel because I suppose people made a fuss of her, you see, because she didn't have a mother, poor little <laughs> Isabel. And I used to hate these great big blue eyes she had. Is she the one that he only used to go up and visit up in Queensland? Was that Isabel? No, that was May, uh, Evelyn Perry. Oh, that was May Evelyn. Perry went up there. Mm. Well, whatever um, happened to Isabel? Anyhow, there was a big, pretty big, a lot of people always around, you know. And I uh, often think what a lot of work my mother must have had to do mm. because she did the washing on that back veranda. And it was a long time before she had any sort of washing machine and she finally got one that she had a lever on it and sort of pumped up and down. Yes. And she would have to do the cooking over here. And we'd be pulled in to help. But I have a feeling there must have been another room uh, between the, this place here and the house because there always seemed to be somewhere where there was a, a tray full of fresh bread or scones. She was great for making cheese scones. So there must have been a bit more room than there was to cook in that, I feel. Um, and then we'd be eating the little, uh, there, it wasn't a kitchen at that time, I think, but you'd be eating in this big room that recently had the billiard room yeah. in it. Yeah. And I remember the, it was a kind of a marble fireplace down the other end, a black and white one, uh, with bookcases either side. And the white ants got into the bookcases. Oh. Yeah, they ate them nearly through, I think. I remember the books being damaged. Uh, but the house is made of tin. The house is made of tin. 
I think that roof might have been uh, might have been remade at some time. This this uncle, the father of the two motherless children, he'd come up the holidays and he was a pretty handy sort of man. And I remember they'd keep some jobs for Uncle Will uh, to do. And at one time he was up in the <coughs> ceiling, uh, probably repairing the guttering or something like that because he had a soldering iron. I remember that a bit. And late that night, um, somebody, I don't know who it was, I think it was Uncle Tick, said the house was on fire. And here was this bit of a blaze up in the ceiling. I hope my memory's all right. I probably was about uh, 10 years old, nine years old. And uh, oh, great stir, and there were no telephones then. Anyhow, it wasn't a very serious fire. They got it put out all right without too much trouble. But I do remember that from far and near, it was a Saturday night, people came, like they do it with uh, deaths. They'd brought uh, um, food, because they didn't know the extent of the fire. There was no telephone. I remember the Dunns, now coming from Dunley, and Mrs Dunn brought pillows and pillow slips and towels. Just in case. Just in case you needed them. But anyhow, all well, it ended well with that lot. And another time, oh, there was a fire in the stables. They were built up there at the back where their tank is. And that was a bit desperate, that lot. I remember it being night time and quite dark, and they're saying, get some water, get some water. And I don't know whether we had a hose, but I can remember running up there with a bucket full of water in bare feet, you know, trying to hurry. But look, I just don't remember the outcome of the stables. I guess at that time they were timber and they were rebuilt later with, um, with uh, you know, this corrugated stuff. And I think there was, uh, somewhere over here there was a big haystack. And I remember the time of the mouse plague. It was dreadful. They'd have uh, these guttering, uh, gutterings or something trying to stop the mice from getting into the haystack. And I, I think they were filled with water, but they'd come out at night and try and catch the mice and they'd put bottles around. And the idea was that the mouse would run into the bottle and he couldn't get out again. Oh, they were, my mother was terrified of mice. She didn't mind spiders. She was frightened of anything else. If there was a spider on the wall, don't touch it. Leave it there, it's eating the flies. But she'd, she'd lift her skirts up and get on a chair just about if there was a thought of a mouse. <laughs> uh, the other side of that big barn and between the old sheds, but those old sheds were not always all there, but it was a hard earth tennis court. Oh, a lot of play was made on that. And uh, on Sundays, see, having seven brothers, uh, there'd always be young people around on Sundays, and only two girls, see. And, uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> we, I think we all played cricket, but I uh, know there always seemed to be a lot of men about. And uh, then they'd have a, a shooting thing. There was a target up here, and they'd be shooting at a tin on a, on a pole out here. Um, how dangerous. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so wonder they didn't catch the chickens because they were <laughs> up there. Yeah. Oh, that was a pigsty over there. No, no, the pigsty was there, at the other end of the barn, actually. Dirty, smelly things. And you'd have to carry up buckets full of stuff for them. And they'd come snorting out, you know, almost breaking the barriers to get them. <laughs> oh, it was horrible. <laughs> But I do remember those cows. <laughs> those cows. I thought just about the worst thing that hap could happen to any female was to have to milk a cow. I didn't mind bringing them home so much. Did you? Bring them home. Milk them. I had to, sometimes. Yeah. It'd probably like the washing up, you'd get out when you could. <laughs> I don't know what age I had to start or what age I, what age I finished, actually. Uh, but there was a big sand drift over there. You'd have to go out through that gate, through the sand. The cows would often be over that area somewhere. Or out behind this line of trees, there would be another paddock out there. And you'd be on the horse, you know. You may have a horse if they were too far away to go and bring the cows in. I don't think I was a very great rider. I don't remember falling off. I probably did. Bareback? 
Oh, I would think so. <laughs> I don't really remember. No, no stirrups or. I wouldn't think. Oh, I'd look, I'd Bridal? really turn. Oh, of course, you'd have to have a thing to hold on to. <laughs> I'd have a saddle on. I would have fallen off if I didn't, if I didn't have a saddle to hold on to. But I'd get up there beyond that rise and look, I'd look to see if we had any visitors. I thought, how marvellous, you know, if somebody had come and there was a car or a buggy or a horse thing here, you know. Oh, somebody's come because this dog must have been looking for company. She hasn't changed. And they'd come and they'd play cricket or whatever was on, you know, and they'd all have a meal. I remember my mother making coffee. She'd make good, really good coffee. And she'd make, oh, great pot full of it, you know, and with milk in it. And everybody loved the coffee. What changed after your father died in 1924? Now, I was, I was 13 years old. Um, I left school then. Boy, I left, he died just before I left school, but I left school in the middle of the year when I turned 14. Um, well, that's, yes, see, I, there wasn't a lot of communication between parents and younger children. I was near the tail end of the family. But I can remember my brother Frank, you know, having to take over. Uh, and I do remember this time, I thought it was rather exciting because uh, the executors, the uh, trustee company, not the executors, I suppose, were some of my uncles or something. Uh, probably Austin Barnes was one of them. But they did have to have these men come up from the city. And I remember my mother you know, perhaps doing special cooking or something, and we'd be cleaning up the house, ready for the... And I think... I'm not sure about this, but I think we had to have a clearing sale. I think you had to sell up everything. And I have a vague memory of, you know, having a clearing sale here, but I, mind, I may not be right about that. Size almost of a, a fair-sized room, you know, bigger than a modern-day bedroom by a long shot. And it was built underground, uh, had a cemented floor with, uh, oh, quite, I suppose, a dozen steps leading down to it from the back veranda. Uh, had a roof over the top. Uh, I suppose it was timbered on the top, although it was all uh, uh, cemented or something underneath. And there'd be tables in there with uh, all rows of preserves and jam and anything you wanted to store for a time. I can remember the carrots being brought home uh, and put in the ground to keep them fresh. She'd bury the carrots to keep them fresh. Mm. But it was a great place down there. My mother was a great um, ginger beer maker. And particularly around Christmas time, uh, you'd have all the ginger beer and the hop beer. The hop beer was a great thing. Yes, hop beer. Yes, but it, it must have been non-alcoholic, I would think. <laughs> well, they'd buy the hops and make it from mm. the hops, right? They'd put the yeast uh, would be put down there to, you know, there'd be a yeast plant or something mm. that had to grow. You'd make your vinegar from these uh, vinegar plants. Uh, but this, uh, on hot days, it was beautiful down there. Go down the steps into the cool cellar. And uh, always at Christmas time, We'd have a big Christmas tree here on this back veranda. That's where the idea of the uh, little parcels on the tree, that's where that originated. And we all great things at Christmas time. Uh, after dark, you know, up come the bottles of uh, ginger beer and soft drinks. And <laughs> soft drinks, you know, homemade, the hop beer and the ginger beer. I think uh, probably only the adults had the hop beer. I mean, Eileen would remember these things better than I would. Um, Hank. Right outside the veranda, uh, the side veranda, and I used to think it was an awesome sort of thing, you know, you didn't go near the tank because you might fall in. To me, the tank uh, seemed to be bottomless, but it must have held a good storage of water, but it did fall away in later years. Maybe that's because they had more tanks, I don't know. Your um, uh, to dig it down. I don't really know how deep it was, you know, not, not nearly as deep as I thought it was, perhaps, but it was more or less underground. Um, Your father put it in? I would imagine so. I would have been born here, but uh, I couldn't tell you much about that. Uh, yeah, you would have actually been born here, wouldn't you? Yes, yes. At that time, we had uh, my mother had somebody to help her 
and she was called Lily, I don't know her other name. Oh, but she, they said she used to spoil me. Maybe she did, maybe she didn't, I don't know. Well, but now we know why. Don't we? <laughs> I think perhaps the help was needed anyway, but what she used to do. All the washing was done there on that back veranda in big tubs, remember the large tubs? Uh, now where was the water heated? Possibly out here somewhere, I would think out in the yard, I would imagine so. And there would be a brick oven there for making bread in the very early days. And then later I think there was an oven um, put in that uh, tin building there. The oven was outside for making the bread? At one time it was, yes, it was a brick thing and you'd open the little door in the front and push the pans in with yeah. the bread in them. Which means you'd have to bake on a good day. Oh, probably. <laughs> well, you wouldn't bake every day, I guess, you know, maybe you'd bake twice a week, I don't know, but you'd, you'd, uh, you'd make your own yeast and you'd have a very large bin and you'd put the yeast and the flour in and you'd mix it all up and you'd have to put it near the stove, near the fire and cover it up with blankets. The yeast rises when it gets warm, hot, you see, and you have to leave it there a certain number of hours till it started to bubble up a bit and then take it out you know, and shape it into the loaves and put them on the trays. Well, I suppose they'd run out with a big tray and shove it in the oven. Oh, I don't remember too much. And there was always a punching ball. Having all the fellows around the house, there was always a big punching ball on the other end of that veranda. Yeah, everybody went past and gave it a bit of a poke. Um, where are we? Oh, we had a... Right at the front of the house, there was the, uh, what we call the best bedroom. I can remember now, in those days, I would change over the rooms. <laughs> yes, the bedrooms. When I got a bit older, I suppose I was a bit restless after I left school. I remember changing the bedrooms. Well, this was the best bedroom. You kept it for visitors and it had a nice bed in with a nice uh, Marcella quilt on it, I think, and frilled pillow slips in that day and age. You know, if you had relations from the city coming to stay, they'd always keep a best bedroom. And I think one time we probably only had the big room down here that later had the billiard table. That would have been the big living area. Yes, now I know. It came right through one side of the house to the other. And eventually when this outside kitchen was done away with, I suppose the family decreased. She left home anyway. Um, it was sectioned off there for a little kitchen. You remember the kitchen with the round table in it and the cupboards built into the wall? Yeah, yes, well at that time, um, I think I tried, to, I probably didn't do it on my own, probably Eileen was in it. We thought we'd make a little sitting room up in the front on the other side. And I have a feeling we changed over the bedroom from that side to this side, when one was the sitting room and one was the best bedroom. And the organ was put up there. The same organ that Eileen has now. I don't know. I, I think the idea of parents in those days thought, well, all right, uh, boys went to work or did the work, the outside work. Um, the women stayed home and they uh, milked the cows and made the butter and fed the pigs and gathered the eggs. <laughs> but I can't... I do remember... But this is all about me, not the... Actually, the family. I must have talked my mother into letting me have um, bookkeeping by correspondence. I remember it came about, but I couldn't tell you how. And we used to get these parcels of things from um, what's a very old firm? Stutz. Stutz was it? Stutz. Taylors. Not Taylors. Wasn't Taylors? Maybe Stutz. Something like that. Anyway, and I'd get these parcels, and I made myself a little desk out of some boxes. And I had it on the front veranda, right around the other, right in the front. And I must have kept on that with that for some time. And that's probably sorted the way, you know, for, for getting a job. Anyway, I wanted to do nursing once, my mother said, oh, that's dirty work, you know, you don't do that kind of thing. They make you scrub the floors. And, and she didn't say empty the bedpan, but she probably thought that. Anyway, uh, this thing came up. Um, Maybe she knew her daughter. <laughs> and f it was decided finally, all right. I don't know how I thought about it, but oh, Gilpin, you know, the 
Oh, Draper. Uh -huh. Moved to the town. He's in that shop, up, shop near the Eureka Hotel, which, and it's now a milk bar. Right, he started up there, and I must have wangled permission somewhere or other to go and start work at O Gilpin's. I must have been, I was there only for a short time, I think, it was like a prison. And how I came to go to Mr Dawson's, I don't, I don't actually know. I mean, these things come about, but, you know, I, can't, I really can't remember what started up. Anyhow, I went there and I was there for all those years, uh, till I moved a bit further afield. I, I really forget how many years I was there. You had to write 200 butter checks. Oh, up to 300, I think. The names are still around there. They say to me, oh, she was uh, at Edelston, or she was at uh, Riseborough. I said, oh, yes, over Hopeton Way. And people out from Lorquin, Nil, Roseberry, that's over Beulah Way. I think yeah. we went as far as Beulah. They'd send the truck out and pick up the cans of, uh, of milk at the, uh, at the gate, so leave them at the gate, and you go ahead and pick them up. Now, how would... Um, did you live in Rainbow? Oh yes, I bought. Oh night? no way! No, I boarded. Yes, mm. I boarded a private house. Yeah, mm. two private, two or three private houses. I was at all together. But uh... and did you come home every weekend? No, no. I can remember sometimes walking home with with a girl, and then Eileen started dressmaking, and she had a little shop there uh, next to the bakery. That's right. right. I know that one. And she went there to do that. And uh, I shared the flat with her oh, then. At the back of the shop? Yes. Oh. Yes, we had more or less just uh, partitioned off, you know. Oh. Yeah, that's right. Oh, I was, uh, when I made the move away, I can't remember. Now, how come Dad used to write to you care of the post office? Because I thought you were working down in Melbourne when you met him. And he told me he used no, to write to you care of the post office. That Oh, probably, because I used to go and pick up the mail every day, you see, at the, for Mr Dawson, mm. at the post office. You'd be there when the train came in, and you think, well, the mail's sorted now, I'll go around and get it, and the papers would be in at the same time. And, um, oh, well, I don't know whether I was in the... Well, I didn't have a post box. Yeah, but how did... Oh, you'd pick them up and you'd go and ask whether there any letters. I thought you met him down in Melbourne. When you I were did too, I was on Melbourne. holidays. Oh. I was on holidays at Hillsville. Oh, I see. With Aileen and this friend of hers who recently died, this Betty Farrant. Oh. Yes, and we went to this guest house at, Mary, at uh, Hillsville. Mm. And we were playing tennis, I think. That's how it all came about in the beginning. <laughs> Wielding the tennis racket. I remember walking along the road into Hillsville. It was a couple of miles out of town. And there'd be, uh, you know, uh, telephone poles, electric light poles on the way. And they'd be throwing stones at them, you know, he's showing off, you know, see if he did the post each time. I remember him playing tennis, belting the balls around the tennis court. Who was he with? He might have been on his own. Himself. I think yeah. so, yes. That was yeah. fate, you see. He'd gone up there for <laughs> holidays and we had to. Yeah, so. Then I went back after that and he must have inveigled me into, well, leave there, you know do something else. And I came down to do a hairdressing course, I tried, do a course in hairdressing. And it folded up and the course was never finished. Right. But I started out half-baked. That's right. And you worked for a doctor? I did for, oh, <clears throat> four or five weeks, maybe. I was in between jobs, you see, and I thought, well, I've got to do something, I've got to have somewhere to live. So I went to this doctor's in Maribyrnong Road. Mm. He was a nice doctor too, Dr. Lim, and he brought you into the world. Mm. Right. And um, he was a very nice man, and uh, I was supposed to be helping, you know, General Factotum. I remember one day she'd made this soup. Her daughter went to uh, one of the high class girls' schools, and she used to bring girls home, you know, from Turak and so on. So. Mrs. Lehman would be wanting these special dishes, and one day she had all this soup in it. I saw this sauce and I tipped it all out because <laughs> I thought it was dirty water and it was her soup. <laughs> I don't know how she put up with it, but I think he liked me anyway. And he used to say, now, you can go into my office and sit in there if you'd like to entertain anyone. You know? <laughs> Penny's office reading all the doctor books. And the <laughs> 
<laughs> no, it was very good. I don't remember. I think I must have said to him, oh, she probably wasn't, didn't care when I did leave anyway, but I think I might have said to him that uh, I was going to get a better job, you know, I was going to do something else. <laughs> but we lived around there afterwards, not far from them, and, and he was our doctor for a time. Mm. How did your family react to to father? Now, being a Catholic? you're um, treading on delicate ground, perhaps. Now today, Maybe. one of the Perkins, <laughs> yeah. I think it was one of the Perkins, said today. Did he today, tell you? He told me. Go on, tell. Oh, you can tell him. You. He said that um, you know when you married Pat. You really threw a spanner in the works up here. But when you came up to visit, we thought, well, he's not as bad as we thought he was. <laughs> After all, maybe it was OK. And he said it really was the most, was a really good thing to happen to that family. Oh, dear. Yeah. And um, Lorda told me that there's such a lot of intermarrying now. They're, one of their daughters is married to a Catholic and somebody else is married to a Catholic. And there are a lot of intermarriages. Yeah. Okay, but how did your mother react when uh, you became a Catholic? She told me my father would mm. turn in his grave. <laughs> Whether he did or not, I don't know, but... Um, he gave the land for the church, didn't he? No, Harry Perkins, Harry my Perkins. Uncle Harry. Oh. Griff's father gave oh. that piece of land in the church. Oh. Yeah, but he, he played the organ, you know, and... Um, I don't know if he played the organ in the church, I don't know about that, but before he came, as a young man, he conducted the choir and he had a baton, which I would still have. Yeah, so I'll probably a bit of consternation, I think. How long did that last? Oh, not very long. Till I was born. <laughs> oh, cute yourself. Would that, be, would that be true? <laughs> not entirely true, no, it wasn't very long. <laughs> Oh, no, it didn't happen. It wasn't, uh, well, it must have been a, a gradual thing, but it didn't take very long, I feel. Yeah. My mother used to come and stay. She used to thoroughly enjoy it. Did she? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. that's good. We'd take her out in the car, you know, and have picnics. And... Oh, yes, she, she really liked the trips. And they all came up here as babies. I used to bring them up in the train. Oh, yes. And she, she came down and reminded me at one stage too. When she I was did, sick. and you came home from mm. hospital crying a little head off because you'd had your appendix out. And I. Did I ring her up, sent her a telegram? And she came down to look after mm. Judith. I remember. Yes. I remember alongside my bed. Oh, she thought you were lovely. You used to sleep with her in the double bed in the room.